We are finishing up our uh, sermon series, Our Identity in Christ, with I am a priest in Christ. 1 Peter 2 9 will be our primary text. But again, I want to uh, go through the uh, sermons that we've already talked about. I am a new creation. I am a child of God. I am redeemed, and I am a priest today. What's the common thing? I am. It's all about the great I am. Not me, but God. Moses said, if they ask who's sending me, who should I say sent me? I am that I am has sent you. Tell them, I am has sent you. See, everything that we are, everything that we do, everything that encompasses our world, everything that encompasses the entire world is all about the I am. Not the me. Now again, just a little bit of a recap. I am a new creation talks about our being in Christ. I am a child of God talks about our relationship with the Heavenly Father. I am redeemed talks about our legal standing. How God adopted us, bought us back, paid the price for us. And today I am a priest. We're going to talk about our responsibilities as a Christian. 1 Peter 2.9 says, if you have your Bible or a pew Bible, you want to open it up, go ahead and do that, 1 Peter. Says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. This verse in and of itself encompasses everything that we've talked about so far in the previous three weeks, plus today. When we talk about I am a new creation, it's talking about being a chosen race and a holy people. God has taken something and done something else with it. When it talks about I am a child of God, it talks about in this verse 2-9 that you are his possession, a parent and a child. When it talks about being redeemed, that he, he called you out of the darkness, he walked you out of the darkness, he took you out of the darkness, he bought you back and brought you into the marvelous light. And I am a priest, that we are a proclaiming priesthood. We are to proclaim the excellence of him who called us. So in 1 Peter 2.9, it encompasses everything that we've talked about. But today we're going to concentrate on responsibility. Now that we are priests in the priesthood of God, What does that mean for us? What does that entail? What are we now supposed to do? Let's look at a little bit of background for the priesthood. Exodus 32 and Numbers 3 talks about the Levites being chosen and set aside for God. Do you all know the story of why the Levites were chosen? Do you all remember that? Remember Aaron built this giant golden calf. Oh, they made me do it, Moses. I didn't want to. 
I told him no. God's not very happy, right? God is bringing his wrath upon the people for their disobedience. A plague upon the people. And Moses says, who will rally around me and fight for the Lord? And it was the Levites who rallied around Moses and fought for the Lord. In fact, they went throughout the camp of Israel and they killed 3,000 brothers who had rebelled against God. And it was that calling out of the Levites and their passion to serve God that God says, they will be mine. And they will serve as the firstborn out of each family. It was, it was the responsibility of, of Jewish families to give the firstborn of animal, the first fruits of the garden, and the firstborn of the family, the oldest child, to God. God says, you keep your kids, I'll take the Levites. So they were set aside for God. A little bit of background. Secondly, we have Exodus 28, uh, verses 1 uh, through 4. You can reference that if you want. That is where God then, out of the Levites, chose Aaron as they began to set up the tabernacle and, and the, uh, the off- offering rites and rituals and the priesthood. So that's the calling out of Aaron and his lineage to serve as priests in the temple and the tabernacle. And then Leviticus chapters 8 and 9 talks about Aaron and his son's ordination and ministry before the Lord. So to be a priest, number one, you had to be a Levite. Number two, you had to be in the lineage of Aaron. And it was the priests who served before the Lord. Now, what did the rest of the Levites do? Weren't they called out to serve God? Yes, they were called out to serve God in the temple in many other capacities. And the Levites were were teachers and guides and judges all throughout the nation of Israel. They didn't just all live in Jerusalem. Everywhere throughout all of the different tribal lands, Levites resided. And they performed their duties there as God's chosen and set aside. Well, let's talk about the high priest and the high priest's duties. Number one, the the high priest was to direct the work of the priests. He was to inquire of the Lord. He was to consecrate the priests. He was to offer the atonement on the day of sacrifice. So, the high priest changed every year. Most often, it was through the casting of lots that the high priest was chosen out of the lineage of Aaron to serve in that year. He was sort of the boss. He was the one that directed all the priestly activity and the Levite activity for the year. And he was the one that would enter into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and offer sacrifice for the people. No one else could enter the Holy of Holies except the high priest. It was a very special honor, a very special calling. And then there's the duties of the priests. They were to teach the people, Jerusalem, but in all of the different tribal lands throughout all of Israel. Levites resided, teaching the people, serving as judges, offering sacrifice back in Jerusalem, if they were in the lineage of Aaron. Okay? Assessing impurities, burning incense, blessing the people, blessing God, keeping the tabernacle and preparing the holy things. They had responsibilities. 
Now, it's a wonderful thing to know that we're not under the law and under the old sacrificial system anymore. We are under the new covenant that comes with the blessing of a new high priest. And that new high priest is Jesus. Jesus is the high priest of the new covenant. We can look at Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our great time of need. See, we don't have to worry about our family lineage anymore. We don't have to worry about what tribe we came out of. Most of us are Gentiles. Yet we are priests by our adoption as children. And we have a high priest, not not chosen by the casting of lots, not chosen again by his earthly lineage, but we have a high priest who was perfect in every way and doesn't reside in Jerusalem, doesn't reside in Judea. He resides in heaven. And he is there. Just as the high priest's responsibilities were, directing the work of the priests, us. Consecrating our lives and ministries. And having offered the atonement for the forgiveness of sins once and for all, he stands in the place. to offer intercession for us before the Father. What a blessing it is to have a high priest like Jesus. But we have responsibilities too, just like the priests did. Under the law, we have responsibilities under the new covenant. And we're going to go through some scriptures. So if you want to follow along... We're going to be sliding around the New Testament. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 3.16 to begin. Where it says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in your midst? Compare that to the Old Testament. The spirit of God rested in the Holy of Holies, hidden behind a curtain, only encountered one time a year. In the new covenant, we are the temple. And the Spirit resides in us and among us and around us. All of us together. We don't have to wait for that one time of year to approach the Father. And hope we do it all correctly. Step by step and right by right and ritual by ritual. No, we can approach the Father Because his spirit is indwelt within us and in our midst. This moment and that moment and the next moment and the next moment and tomorrow and next week and next year. It doesn't go away. It is a permanent fixture in the life of a believer. And God is always there to listen. We can turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. 
where it says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Responsibility, spiritual sacrifice. We're not killing any bulls. We're not offering any doves. We're we're not slaughtering any lambs. Yet we are sacrificing in spirit. We are to live in the spirit. As just said in 1 Corinthians, the spirit dwells within us and around us. We're going to jump to Romans chapter 12. Skip over Micah for now. And we talk about duties here for a priest. Paul says, verse 1, that I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's the spiritual sacrifice, giving of ourselves, our our, our very essence, our very life, our very being, back to God. Chapter 12 is just filled with responsibilities. If we look at uh, verse 3, For by uh, by the grace... Given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to you. Our responsibility is to be sober in our judgments. Is to be righteous in our actions. Is to be responsible with the Spirit. He goes on in verse 4 and following, For just as each of us have one body with many parts, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, part of the priesthood. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Our responsibility as priests is to live out our gift. A few, uh, few months ago, we did the spiritual gift inventory and everybody received the, the results of, of their giftedness. And, and you have a responsibility as a priest in the kingdom of heaven to live that out. You can't take that gift and hide it under a bushel basket. You can't tell God, I don't like that one. Give me a different one. take your child shoe shopping and you pick out some shoes and they want those. It doesn't work like that way in the priesthood. When God says this is your responsibility and this is your gift, you say thank you very much. And you get to work. If there is anybody here who still doesn't understand their giftedness, even after going through uh, the, the lessons that we had on spiritual gifts and taking the inventory and having it interpreted, if you're still struggling, see one of us on staff. We will do our very best to make it clear for you so that you can step in to that responsibility as a priest. You don't want to get to heaven... And say, well, God, I just, I never really understood it. So I didn't worry about it. No, we want to live in it here and now. And then in verse 9, probably one of the greatest responsibilities of the priesthood is love. 
where Paul says love must be sincere. We are to live out our responsibilities in love. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. All responsibilities of a priest. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. It, it's all about relationship. It's all about being together. It's all about helping each other. It's all about listening to each other. It's all about being there for each other. I don't remember who said it. Somebody said, no man is an island. And that's so true. We need each other. In the priesthood, in the kingdom, and in the world. I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. That's all a part of our responsibility to each other. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, Paul says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Responsibility of the priesthood. We can go to Galatians chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 16, 22 through 26, where Paul, speaking to the churches in Galatia, he says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. All throughout the Old Testament, the priesthood was corrupted by men who sought to seek the desires of the flesh. Paul knows that, that even under the new covenant, sadly, many of us will will try to make our way back to the world of sin. And he says, you have a responsibility to live by the Spirit. And if you, can, if you can maintain that responsibility, you won't be pulled back into the world of sin. We are to live in and use and work through the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22 and following. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Throughout the verses that I pulled out, I I included Micah chapter 6, verse 6 through 8. I want you just to write that down in your margin or write it on on your bulletin. And I want you to go and find that verse later today sometime. It talks about, from an Old Testament perspective, a New Testament reality. It talks about sacrifice. And the mindset and the mentality of the Jews about, sure, here's my pigeon, here's my dove, here's my lamb, here's my goat. Sacrifice it so I can get home and get back to what I want to do. 
to the truth of the matter of serving God, which is exactly what the responsibilities of the New Testament priests are, to serve God through the Spirit with everything we have, to give God our very best, not just once a year on the Day of Atonement, not just on special occasions, not just at Christmas Eve service, not just at Easter time, not just on your birthday, but every day. You have been, you have been grafted in to the kingdom of God. And being grafted, you are created anew and made a child of God and have been redeemed through Christ so that you might serve Him. And it all goes back to how every other sermon has ended simply because God loves you. God loves you so much that He saved you from your sin. He loves you so much that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever might believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. He loved you so much that He created in you a newness through His Holy Spirit and took you as His son and took you as His daughter. He loved you so much that He has appointed you a priest in his kingdom. And he trusts you with those responsibilities because he loves you. That's the message that we need to get into our hearts, into our minds, into our spirit. And that's the message that we need to get out into the lives of others. that they might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You can't save anybody, folks. But you can share the gospel with them. And you can pray for them. And you can watch God do the miracle in changing a life. And every one of us is responsible to that very thing. So the challenge is set before you. The knowledge of knowing that God loves you beyond compare is something you need to hide in your heart. If you are still struggling with that, if you still are one of those people who says, I know he loves John. I I know he loves Larry. I think he loves Jane. But he doesn't love me. He can't love me. I'm... I'm no good. I've done some things that these people don't know about. I I have sinned more than anybody here. There's no way he could love me. Remember what Paul said. He says, of sinners which I am the worst. And he believed that God loved him. If you are still struggling with the love of God, I I just challenge you to let somebody pray for you today. Don't leave this place without let somebody in and pray for you. Come forward if you want. We'll pray with you. Talk to the person on your left or your right. Find somebody in a little while in the Welcome Center and just say, I don't know how God can love me. Let them pray for you and minister to you and encourage you. Maybe you've been shirking your responsibilities as a priest and it's time to get back to work. Say, God, I'm sorry. I, 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 I've been absent for some time now, but I'm back. He'll say, welcome home. Get back to work. Not to earn anything. Not to achieve a higher place in heaven. But simply because he loves you. And you love him.